Greetings, travelers. I'm Gav. Welcome to another Last Epoch lore video. Are you ready to finally restore the Epoch in Chapter 3? Let's do a quick recap before diving in. In Chapter 2, after defeating the Husk of Elder Panion, the second shard of the Epoch floats above the ground before us. It was drawn to the shard that we carried, and once the two combined, a rift was opened. Through the rift, we're brought to the end of time. This is what is left of your timeline, and many others. Welcome to the end of time. Here we find a familiar face, Elder Gaspar. This time's Gaspar has been in this future for quite some time. I have been here for a long time. Long enough for time to lose meaning. For my original self to lose meaning. I have absorbed the faded selves of too many other Gaspars to count. In the process, I've become adept at guiding the shades that flow here. They have become adept at combining the power of our past selves, also called shades, to us. By choosing the shades we would like guided to us, we ascend in our chosen mastery and are stronger than ever. We travel back to the ruined era to tell this time's Gaspar the bad news about Panion. They tell us that the third and final shard of the Epoch lies within the fallen temple of Atera. Retrieving it is ours and the people of Last Refuge's only hope within this ruined future. By reforming the Epoch, you will be able to return to your time and take us with you, away from this ruin. On our way out of the Council Chambers, we speak with Chronomancer Lorene. We tell them that we will keep an eye out for any more spontaneous time rifts during our travels on the surface. Geova the Archivist also has a quest for us. It's regarding other potential survivors within the Lost City, dubbed the Lesser Refuge. The city is said to be in a tunnel system underground near Welrin. We agree to look for any signs of it and any survivors as we pass through. We unseal the rune door and start making our way towards the surface. Now that you're all caught up and ready for Chapter 3, let's get into it. The Sheltered Wood as we head east through the various twists and turns of these woods, we find our first rune prison. These have some lore significance. These rune prisons were introduced in patch 0.9.2 beta, alongside the mage class's third and final mastery, the rune master. Rune masters uphold the order of magic in the arcane arts. Mages were found to be performing dangerous arcane experiments and were imprisoned by the rune masters, locked away inside these rune prisons and exiled away through time to ensure that they never see the light of day again. We travelers, however, find that the death penalty is more efficient. We break them out of their cages for their sweet loot. These mages will always drop an experimental item containing an experimental affix, the outcomes of their dangerous meddling with the arcane arts. We cross a land bridge and see a massive titan with a body made of both rock and twisting vines and trees, adorned with mushrooms all along the top of their body. They seem to have been lying dormant for quite some time. The mountainous titan seems unaffected by the void and just continues stomping by. Finally nearing the surface, we see a set of stairs. An aged note lays on the ground at the top of the steps. The note has been preserved by magic in order to ward off those that make it this far. It says, The safety of Last Refuge does not extend beyond this point. Beyond the shard's light is the darkness of the void and the madness of the cults that worship it. Turn back now. If you do not, may what remains of Atera's light protect you. We of course ignore this warning and ascend to the void-ridden surface. The cultists had a philosophy. The void transcends reality. And by embracing it, so could they. After all, this world was gone. If they devoted themselves to despair, it welcome them. A form of hope. Desperate. Worthless in the end. The Surface The surface is absolutely covered in void. Ruined buildings and corruption line our path forward. I didn't find any secrets or lore in this zone really, but definitely let me know down in the comments if you did. To the north is a ridge that we want to scope out, and further to the east is the trail leading towards Welrun. We first explore the ridge to the north. The Shrouded Ridge 
In this area is where we first meet the void cultists that we've heard so much about. Half human, half void amalgamations that are highly aggressive and attack without warning. Their only insane motive is to further spread the corruption of the void. We continue along the ridge to the north when we're suddenly attacked by a void horror. These horrors have one gigantic club-like fist and crawl along the ground in an almost serpent-like way. Their other hand is sprawled out on the ground. They use it to both stabilize as well as propel themselves forward as they slither towards us. We take out the horror and continue on. As we come to the bottom of the ridge, we see an entrance into the mountain. The Lightless Arbor The Lightless Arbor is a dungeon within the game. To enter, you'll need a specific dungeon key which we haven't obtained yet. I plan to cover each dungeon in their own future video. In those, I'll uncover every piece of lore and story connection that I can find, so definitely stay tuned for that on my channel. For now though, the purpose of this section is the dialogue of the NPC that stands at the entrance. The Lost Spriggan speaks on the Titans a bit. Human, can you understand me? That's good. Everyone else seems to have lost themselves. As soon as they woke, they started stomping about, rumbling the entire mountain with their steps which sounds exactly like the behemoth that we saw walking in the sheltered wood. They are the only source of life that massive I can sense. So it may have been. Wait, I also detect other humans, and they are all under the mountain. No, this is not good. Apparently the slumbering titans of the ancient era have lost themselves. We tell them that the humans they sense underground is the city of last refuge. They won't live there for long while the mountain beneath is lumbering around, causing cave-ins and avalanches. Someone needs to stop them before the humans are all shattered into splinters. You are the only other living being that isn't acting like their head has rotted through, so you're going to have to help me. They beg us to help stop the Titan, the mountain beneath, within the Lightless Arbor. Otherwise, they fear what will happen to the Last Refuge and the humans that are underground. We'll return to the Lightless Arbor once we have a dungeon key. We waypoint back to the surface and begin down the eastern trail towards Wellrun. The Forsaken Trail As we travel through this trail, filled with spiders and more void cultists, we pass by a few grave sites. These small stone structures house a single ever-burning candle. There are several stone coffins resting above the ground. The light of the candle seems to slightly draw back the darkness of the void. The coffins are surrounded by metal bars, seemingly to prevent grave robbers or creatures from disturbing them. I have no idea if this has any lore significance, I just found it to be a cool sight. There's quite a few of these random grave sites spread throughout the zone. Continuing east, we pass by some kind of ritual site. There are six altars in a circle surrounding the large stump of an ancient tree. Definitely odd, but no notes or anything on what's going on here. North from here, through more waves of void cultists, we come to a camp at the end of a trail. The Cultist Camp Although it's dubbed the Cultist Camp, these void cultists don't seem aggressive like the others. We speak with the two that appear to be the leaders of this camp, Maketh and Leda. We are immediately assured that they're not like the madmen that we met on the road. They're survivors that retained their sanity after giving in to the oblivion of the void. They confirm for us that this is indeed the outskirts of Welrin, and that it's seen better days. We tell them that we need to reach the Temple of Atera. The two offer to provide safe passage into Welrin if we can assist them in retrieving two relics that they need for a ritual. They're trying to strike a deal. They state that the ritual is to help give them the power to defend themselves from the mad cultists. To the south lies the Welrin docks, which contains the first necessary relic. They say that on the first few days of the Void's triumph hundreds of years ago, that a soothsayer known as the Oracle sent aid to Welrin, a symbol of hope. The city was one of the last to fall prey to the Void's corruption thanks to this symbol. Rumor has it that the cultists of the docks have taken the symbol and are attempting to defile it. The second artifact is a phylactery filled with raw soul essence. It belongs to one of the last known remaining undead of the Immortal Empire. They are in the Welrin Undercity beneath the ruins to the north. We accept their proposal. Another cultist in the camp named Halandor wants to speak with us. He gives us some insights into the void horror creature that we fought earlier along the Shrouded Ridge. These horrors are brought forth by the cultists that allowed the void to consume them. 
driven to violence and relishing in cruelty, the atrocities that they commit taints the void and attracts these horrors. Welrin now lies in ruins and is filled with cultists and creatures of the void. We offered to help defeat the void horrors within the city ruins, but first we head south. The Welrin Docks We enter the dark and ominous docks. The void's corruption has spread entirely throughout this area, including throughout the waters. These docks would have been built up along what was once the Sea of Norsareth. In the ancient era, its pristine blue waters sat calmly below the floating tower of Atera, now completely in ruin and covered in void. We continue south until we come to a large crucified cultist, with a brightly glowing object sticking out from their chest. Suddenly we're ambushed by a void centipede that burrows out from underneath the ground. We take out the centipede and remove the symbol of hope from the chest of this massive cultist. Exiting the docks, we head north towards the city ruins. The Ruins of Welrin What was once the great scholarly city of technological advancement, and the home to the great college of the arcane arts, Welrin now lies in ruin. The city was built up in very close proximity to the Temple of Atera, which is where the majority of the technologies, learnings, and studies of the arcane arts came from. The mage class character was once a teacher of the arcane, an elder among the Council of Mages within Welrin. Their student was the Acolyte class character. She rebelled against the teachings of the Arcane, seeing it as trivial and seeking a more powerful magic, the Necrotic Arts, a magic forbidden by the Order of Mages due to its foul practices. The Acolyte was banished from the city. Not long after, the mage character exiled themselves in shame. Their stories both bring them back to Welrin, ironically, only to get caught up in the fight against Raye. And that's where the game begins. If you want to know more about the classes and their backstories, I have all of the cinematics and lore for every class in a single video. Unfortunately, these cinematics are no longer in the game, so if you'd like to know more about each class's backstory, definitely give it a look. I'll link that down in the description as well as the card in the top right, if you're interested. We take out the void horrors patrolling the ruined city and enter the crypts. I didn't find any secrets or lore hidden in this zone, definitely let me know if you did. Down the steps we go to find this phylactery. The Welrin Undercity The Undercity is some kind of catacomb or crypt beneath Welrin. It's one giant square. We enter and head west to find the last Imperial. They're a withering undead skeleton that's protruding from some kind of fleshy mass. Intertwined with the flesh are tubes. Tubes feeding them soul essence from their soul repositories. Killing the living and feasting on their soul essence is how those of the Empire remained immortal and how this last remaining Imperial still is. The undead tells us that they feared the void, and so out of that fear they harvested and stored up a supply of souls to remain down here, safe from the spread of the void's corruption, and with enough soul essence to last them quite a while. The last Imperial offers us their phylactery, in exchange for freeing them from this prison, a prison of their own design, that they now find themselves in. In order to do so, we first need to destroy all three of their soul repositories, found throughout the Undercity. We do a full square, destroy all three repositories, and return to the last Imperial. They thank us for this kindness, a true death, one that they and their peers never thought that they would succumb to. The Imperial tells us to stand back, that removing the phylactery from their body may be volatile. Suddenly they implode into nothingness. All that remains is their phylactery. The path that the Imperial was blocking is now open as well. We pick up the phylactery and take the now open tunnel. It takes us back around and up to the camp. The Cultist's Camp As we enter the camp, it looks abandoned. There's no one to be seen. We continue further in and find a single remaining cultist. They seem to have been waiting for us, and we ask them where everyone is. The cultist says that they're all setting up the ritual site just ahead. They were asked to stay behind and inform us. This cultist seems a little overly excited about the upcoming ritual. We journey west to catch up with everyone and bring them the symbol of hope and the phylactery. The Ritual Site The road leading to the site contains countless ritualistic crucifixions of those same behemoth cultists that we saw in the docks. The roads are also completely covered in void. We make our way to the cultists of the camp at the top of the hill. Standing in the middle are Maketh and Leda. We provide the artifacts and they begin the ritual. 
the entire ritual was some kind of mad cultist ploy to combine their bodies into some kind of void amalgamation. They are just as insane as the rest. We take down the void creature that they've become and continue on past a bridge to the next zone. The Shattered Valley To the south within this zone, we see a time rift opened up and immediately go for it. We travel through it to the Ancient Era. The Ancient Forest, negative 6020 BE. We make our way through the forest filled with primal bugs and Chireans. We come to a diamond-shaped metal structure that looks to be a Terran technology, a pylon of some kind. As we approach the device, it suddenly lifts up into the air and begins floating and spinning above the rocks that it just sat among. Why did this activate when we walked near it? What is the purpose of this device? Let me know your theories down in the comments. We continue east and come to another device. It too activates as we approach it, and begins hovering and spinning above the ground. We pass by this one too as nothing further seems to happen. It just keeps spinning. Finally we come to the forest's end. Standing among scorched ground and a flowing river of lava is a primeval dragon. They appear to have seen better days. Their wings are tattered, their horns are broken and stubby, and I can't tell if they're blinded or have multiple eyes or what's going on in the whole facial region there. We dodge its fire breaths and attacks and take down the dragon. I couldn't find anything else throughout this forest. Secrets, lore, or otherwise. We exit the ancient era by waypointing back to the ruined era's shattered valley. From there, we enter the tunnels to the north. The Abandoned Tunnel We fight our way through large spiders and dinosaur-like creatures called Lithrax. Lithrax have a club-like tail and look like they could potentially be descendants of the ancient era's raptor-like Chirian. We make our way through the tunnels to the entrance of the lesser refuge that Jehovah the Archivist spoke of. I found nothing else of lore significance here in the tunnels, and no secret areas either. Let me know if you do. The Lost Refuge This zone contains a bunch more void husk creatures, cave scorpions and spiders as well. Nothing really of note on my way through the zone until we get to the end. On a pedestal in a torn down home is an old tome. It archives the history of the second group of human survivors that lived in this cave system. Their journey underground was made when the void began to sweep across the surface. Many years ago at this point, the tome chronicles the history of Magister Wallace. Wallace led this group of survivors underground to survive and take shelter from the void. The Magister cursed the cowardice of the elders of Last Refuge, angry at them for wanting to flee into the mountains when the Empire was at its weakest. The old tome also mentions some outcast queen, who Wallace didn't seem fond of either. All of this distrust, combined with the ravenous spread of the void, led to Wallace and those that would follow him to embark on an exodus underground to these very tunnels. He seemed to have no sympathy for the Imperials either, wagering that the Void was the result of one of their foul experiments on the living. Noting the poetic justice and the fact that the Void that they potentially wrought is now the Empire's doom, he seems to deeply underestimate the corruption of the Void at the time that this entry was written. Wallace was under the impression that the whole thing would blow over and that they could return to the surface soon after, that this underground refuge was just a temporary living situation. Deeper into the tome, we find entries in a different handwriting. The anonymous writer states that this is their last will and testament, and it's ironic that it's written in Wallace's journal. Wallace apparently doomed their group of survivors by offering them up to the Void cultists once they were found, a desperate attempt to save themselves. The Magister wasn't spared by the cultists either, however. This new writer states how it was funny seeing Wallace torn to pieces and not getting away with their cowardly betrayal. The Magister and the other survivors had lived here in the tunnels for decades, sheltered from the void with the assurance by the Magister that they were in no real danger, only for the void to sweep in and end them all. They seemed to remember their time spent here fondly and note how Wallace was wrong. This wasn't just some lesser refuge. It was these survivors' last refuge from the void. It was their home. To them, it was the refuge. We pick up the tome and waypoint back to the council chambers to relay our findings. The Council Chambers We speak with Chronomancer Lorene and inform them of the time rift that we found in the Shattered Valley, the rift that brought us to the ancient forest. We tell her of the primeval dragon that we fought, 
They marvel at the point in time that we were brought to, a time before civilization. Does this confirm that the humans lived within the Terra's temple the entire time? Were there uncivilized primal humans living among the dinosaurs and dragons, like shown in the cave painting? Or is that cave painting of some other point in time, or a different event entirely? So many questions. We informed Jehovah the Archivist of the old tome that we found in the Lesser Refuge. The history of the other survivors is tragic, but their memory will forever remain through this tome, and placed among the other pieces of history within the last archive. We waypoint back to the valley. The Shattered Valley. Having already explored the time rift to the south in this zone, as well as the tunnels to the north and finding the Lesser Refuge, we make our way east, fighting through void cultists, nests of void wings, and several void consumed grolls. We enter the next zone. The Courtyard. The courtyard nearing the Temple of Atera is adorned with statues and places of worship. Some of the statues suddenly become animated and attack us. There's unfortunately no name or health bar that displays for them, so I have no idea what these animated statues are actually called. Making our way through hundreds more void wings and void cultists, we finally reach the entrance to the fallen Temple of Atera. As we approach the doors, the massive Ateran Temple Guardian whirs to life. The Ateran technology that makes them tick still works to this day. The Guardian says, As the temple fell from the heavens, you will fall before me, and attacks. Throughout the fight, we have to fend off wave upon wave of void cultists as well. We take down the Guardian and enter the temple. The Temple of Atera. What were once the beautiful divine halls of this temple now lie in ruin, tainted by the spread of the void pillaged for centuries by the mages of Welrin, among others, for its treasures, technologies, and knowledge of the arcane arts. As we cross a long bridge near the temple's entrance, we pass by a waypoint and come through an archway, the door of which has fallen. As we enter, a chilling voice suddenly calls out, This place has seen such sorrow. We fight through countless void-corrupted creatures and husks, through the winding corridors of the temple, as we approach the Lotus Halls, we're attacked suddenly by a behemoth void creature, an abyssal fiend. We dispatch the fiend and the entrance to the next zone is revealed. The Lotus Halls. We make our way to the lower bridge that leads to the lowest level of the temple. As we approach the bridge, we notice that the Ateran bridge control device is missing parts. Without these parts, the bridge leading to the depths of the temple refuses to activate. The shards guide us to the statues on either the northeastern or northwestern side of the temple. It really doesn't matter which one you choose, as both have the same quest text and everything, it's just kind of mirrored. However, when we arrive at these statues, it's just another broken device. There's nothing to be found here. We allow the shards of the epoch to guide us through time, to a point where we can retrieve these missing parts. A time rift to the ancient temple is opened and we step through. This point in time has the parts that we need from this device. Also, this room contains two pylon-like devices, like we keep seeing in the ancient era. They too activate and begin floating and spinning in the air as we approach them. We obtain the missing parts thanks to the help of the Epoch and travel back to the ruined era temple. The weird thing, and it might be a bug, but when we travel to the ancient temple through the time rifts that the Epoch opens for us, the zone still says the Lotus Halls, and we still appear to be in the Ruined Era, so I'm not sure if that's just a display bug, or if we're still in the Ruined Era when we port to the Ancient Temple, or how far back in time we're actually visiting the Temple in to get those parts. Let me know what you think down in the comments. We return to the bridge, we reactivate the device, and the bridge stairs extend downwards to the lowest depths of the Temple. The Sanctum Bastille the name Sanctum Bastille implies a prison of some kind, or a fortress to hold or protect something, or someone, of immense power. As we make our way inside, that same chilling voice calls out. We continue on through more void creatures and void husks. They seem to mistake us for the Mother Goddess. is that you? Maybe because we hold the shards of the Epoch? Who does this voice belong to? We press on trying to find this entity, through more void enemies of various types. We finally reach the bottom of the Bastille. 
As we do, suddenly a time rift opens up before us. We enter the time rift. The end of ruin. As we come out the other side, we're bombarded by the voice. Heathrow is dead. Horribus is free. The voice belongs to the remains of the immortal emperor themselves. They seem to have been consumed and maddened by the void. The emperor calls out to void forms and bombards us with void attacks. We take out what remains of the emperor and they implode into oblivion, consumed into nothingness. Were they a prisoner here? Or were they attempting to shelter themselves here from the void, only to become corrupted by it? Let me know what you think. All that remains is the third and final shard of the epoch, suspended in the air. We approach the last shard. The two shards that we possess are reaching out to the third. We claim the third shard and reform the epoch. On the precipice of a broken world, there is hope. The epoch is reforged. As the traveler left, their real journey began. After reforming the epoch, we're brought to the end of time and tell Gaspar the good news. They tell us that they may have pinpointed the point in time where the void began to spread. Much like Magister Wallace, Elder Gaspar believes that it was the greed and atrocities of the immortal emperor that first brought the void to a terra. They tell us to visit the imperial era. And that concludes chapter 3. If you learned something about Last Epoch's lore today, please give this video a thumbs up. If you're looking forward to more stories of Atera, definitely subscribe to my channel. We now have all three shards and a completed epoch, the last artifact of its kind. We've unlocked the epoch's full potential, the power to travel through time, hopefully now in a more precise manner. Who is the Immortal Emperor actually? How will we stop them? Let me know your theories down in those comments. We'll attempt to find out all of that and more in Chapter 4. I'll see you there. Farewell, travelers.